It can be any subtype. So some of them are triple negative, but most of them actually are not. So why do we care about triple negative breast cancer? Again, here's the definition of it, but this is how common it is. It makes up about 15% of breast cancers in the, in the United States. More in younger women, uh, you know, higher proportion in younger women, higher proportion in African American women, but overall about 15%. It's about 25 to 30,000 cases per year in the United States, but because of the prognostic implications of it, because there's a higher risk of relapse, it has a disproportionate uh, relationship to the number of deaths from breast cancer. So I'm going to address sort of three main questions. You know, there's a lot to talk about in these two topics. The first is, do chemotherapies, since that's the mainstay of treatment, work differently in triple negative disease? Is triple negative disease in women who have inherited breast cancer different? And why is inflammatory inflammatory? So the first is, I told you what triple negative is. What it isn't is a coherent biology. So triple negative is a name of convenience. It's a clinical entity. Um, as you can see down here, if you look at the molecular subtypes of breast cancer, triple negative, it actually, you can see any molecular subtype of breast cancer in a clinically triple negative tumor. Most of them are made up of either the basal-like subtype or a more newly di uh, defined one called Claude and Lowe, but you can even see luminal, which we typically think of as ER positive. You can see HER2 enriched. You can see anything in there. So this isn't telling you much about biology. But there's been a rapid evolution of our understanding of these subtypes. Now the caveat here is getting it into clinical use is a big step. So, so we're, we're taking the steps up to that, but of course everybody says the first, the next big advance that they read about in the newspaper that's found in a test tube or in a mouse doesn't mean that tomorrow we should do that in people. But the fact is that there's, there's tons of different approaches. And I'm going to say as a clinician, the nice thing that from my standpoint is that the, even though the scientists may, may fight with each other about whose subtype approach is better, the truth is that they are all tending to find similar biologies, and they are relatively concordant with each other, which is reassuring for us clinicians, because that means it's much more likely to come to the clinic quickly. So the things that are relevant, of course, that they're focusing on is, are the prognostically relevant biologic subsets and therapeutically relevant there are subsets within triple negative. So, chemotherapy and metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Remember that there are two goals of therapy in the metastatic setting, no matter what subtype it is. Control the cancer and don't make the patient sick, right? So everything is about controlling the cancer and not making the patient sick. I'm not doing anybody any favors if I control their cancer and put them in bed for the rest of their life. So here's the true or false question that I'm going to be addressing. You should take the fact that something is triple negative into account when you're deciding which chemotherapy to give in metastatic disease. So here's the dogma, and this is based on laboratory studies and animal models. Triple negative breast cancer is resistant to taxol-type drugs. Right? That is, there is an old wives' tale about that. So is it true? Some old wives' tales are true. There were investigators that looked at a whole bunch of trials, and here's all of these trials. Um, they were largely, HER2 was excluded, so this is the ER negative, HER2 negative subset, and said, okay, let's just look at that subset and see if comparing to a very traditional drug, anthracyclines, are taxanes better or worse? And the fact is that taxanes, so here's, this means everything's equal is this line, everything to the left means that the taxane was better, which is what they saw in the parent studies. And this argues against that old dogma that taxanes don't work in triple negative breast cancer. And in fact, we do use taxanes quite frequently in triple negative breast cancer. So what about other choices? What about the next lines? And that's what we're going to talk about. So the next order of business is, OK, you've had your taxane. Maybe it worked for, for a few years. Now it's time to, to try another drug, either because you're getting neuropathy, say. What's your second drug of choice? Now there was a very nice study that looked at the next choice down the road and compared the LODA to Halivan. The overall study, the Zalota and the Halivan, were about the same. In fact, in the triple negative, the Halivan looked a little bit better, but it's a subset, and you have to be a little, little cautious about overinterpreting that. How do you choose between those if, in general, they're about the same? Do you want the doc to flip a coin, for example? Probably not. Now, the one thing we can say is these drugs have really different side effects. A lot of chemotherapies, and we talk about chemotherapy as sort of as if you know there are chemotherapy side effects, but the fact is, for anybody in the room, who in the room has had chemotherapy? All righty. 
are all chemotherapy drugs the same from a side effect standpoint? No. So, for example, there's halovin, low blood counts, hair loss, nerve damage, uh, Zolota, rash on your hands, feet, diarrhea, etc. That is really important to take into account because if you choose one first, it doesn't mean the other one isn't available to you later, right? So it's equally important to take into account the patient's own what their propensity. If they already have nerve damage, for example, you may not want to use halovin first. So I think toxicity, to me, is a very key variable in decision making about what chemotherapy choice you're going to make in metastatic triple negative breast cancer. And these are the kinds of things that you can and should take into account, and you can have this conversation with the patients as you're going through the decision making process. You like my pumpkin? It's very timely, right? <laughs> Okay, so moving on, what about inherited breast cancer? Because there is an emerging thinking that inherited breast cancer itself confers some information about sensitivity of the tumor that maybe we should take into account. So let's first talk, what is inherited breast cancer? Is that you get abnormal DNA, typically BRCA1 or BRCA2, from either your mother or your father, that may, gives you a marked predisposition to breast and ovarian cancer. Now, the thing to consider for this particular talk is for BRCA1 mutation carriers, when they get breast cancer, 80% of the time it's triple negative. There's a very tight association, and that triple negative is that basal kind of triple negative. BRCA1 is a really important gene. What BRCA1 does in part, it actually does a bunch of things, but one of its key things is that it helps your cells repair damage to their DNA, which you get when you walk outside and the sunlight hits you, the DNA in your skin cells can get damaged, right? That's, that's normal. When you, you know, eating things, living, right? Just living and breathing, you get damaged to your DNA. There is a cellular machinery that's in place to fix that. It's normal and it's totally standard. BRCA actually is really important in, in one of those kinds of DNA damage repair. So there are a couple things I'm going to say about the triple negative part of this. So we talk about BRCA1-associated breast cancers, but in addition to basal-likeness, which is typical of BRCA1-associated breast cancer, there are actually a whole laundry list of things that scientists have kind of said, listen, when a BRCA1 patient gets a breast cancer, those cancers have certain characteristics, and there's sort of a laundry list over there. You see those in people who don't have inherited breast cancer. So are those cancers the same? Do they act the same or not? That's actually an unanswered question, but it's a good one. One of the hallmarks is sensitivity to DNA damage. And remember that some chemotherapy drugs, their main way of acting is by damaging DNA. Other chemotherapy drugs work by different mechanisms. So you know, should you be choosing your chemotherapy to go towards those that are more sensitive to this kind of, of damage. So this is a, a kind of a, 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 I like the table thing, this is a way of uh, kind of explaining a little bit better if you think about it. So there's multiple ways of repairing DNA. And if you think of each of the table legs as a, as a mechanism, they all hold the cell up. If you don't have BRCA, and remember you inherit one abnormal BRCA from mom or dad, in the cancer, the other one gets lost. So typically, you've lost both of them in your cancer. So the table may still be standing up, but it's a little wobbly, right? So if you hit down another one of those legs, it's going to fall, OK? That's, that's the propensity. It's teetering, all right? And so the idea is, can you leverage that? So without BRCA, the cells are prone to being killed by DNA damaging agents. Some chemotherapy, ionizing radiation actually works by direct DNA damage. So that's, a, you know, I say platinum drugs, but remember, this is also relevant for our radiation therapy. So the cells, it's not that they can't repair their DNA, they got to go to plan B. So plan B, in some cases, and this is important therapeutically, it uses an enzyme called PARP. So one of those other legs is dependent on PARP. So this is where the whole argument about PARP inhibition and the possible role of PARP inhibition comes from, because that knocks out another leg and over, over the cell goes. So that's the treatment opportunity. But let's talk about platinums first, because we're still talking about chemotherapy right now. So platinums and other DNA damage in chemotherapy, and I'm going to throw in ionizing radiation. If one of my radiation docs was, friends was here, he'd be in the back yelling at me. So that shows a lot of promise in known BRCA-associated tumors. But remember, that's a minority. And the studies are small, OK? 
That said, in metastatic disease, there's certainly the strongest evidence, small and taken with that caveat, is from true BRCA-associated tumors that platinums may have a real, a real role to play earlier than you might use it otherwise. We also know that in preoperative or neoadjuvant studies, in triple negative breast cancer, you augment response. That's okay, but response is not what we're trying for here. We don't know that it's going to change relapse rates, and we don't know that it's going to change survival. I care a lot less about response in a patient who's feeling fine, right? That's a tumor characteristic. It's not a patient characteristic. I'm much more interested in whether the patient relapsed or didn't and is alive 10 years later. So we know it augments response. We don't know that it, that it translates into the more meaningful things. Moreover, we don't know which patients, if it does translate, which patients is it going to translate in because these big neoadjuvant studies were done in unselected triple negative breast cancer. We know it's active in metastatic disease. When do we use it? We know it's a good drug. I use, I use cisplatin, I use carboplatin, I use all of these drugs routinely. But do, when, how, do I, how do I organize where to, to give it? So there is a study coming in December. So just hold that thought for a few more months because the TNT study, which is a very straightforward, triple negative metastatic first line, first line meaning the patients haven't had any chemotherapy for their metastatic disease before, platinum versus ataxane. It's a straight up comparison, very straightforward. They are doing the correlative studies on the tissues because they're going to say, A, is it better, worse, or the same, and B, if it is better, worse, or the same, why? Right? In which tumors does one seem to be better than the other? Because that gets back to our biggest problem, which is how do we identify those that are sensitive? So to summarize, from the standpoint of tailoring chemotherapy by subtype of breast cancer, right now there isn't enough evidence that we should choose differently based on triple negative versus any other subtype if you are going to be using chemotherapy. Now, there are some principles of using chemotherapy that I think are also worth, worth noting, and that is using two drugs together in general is a good idea for patients who have symptoms, and the reason for that is if you use two drugs, you have a higher likelihood of response and quicker response than if you just use one drug, or pay tumors that are really rapidly progressing that you have to get ahead of. Otherwise, it's probably better to use one drug at a time, right? You use them in sequentially. And the reason for that is, A, you've saved your drugs longer, right, if you don't use two of them at the same time. And you're not accumulating resistance patterns to two drugs at the same time. And every time you add two chemotherapy drugs together, there's no way that it's not more toxic. It's always more toxic. So if tolerability is one of our main goals, one way is not to throw too much at it unless you need to. And then we choose the drugs by our known efficacy. Does it work? What do we, how, do we, how, well, how well do we know that it works in the first line setting, second line setting, third line setting? What, how, what's, our, what's our known parameters there? Toxicity, you may make a different choice in a patient who's prone to diarrhea or a patient who already has neuropathy than you might in another patient. And preference, some patients, you know, oral drugs are nice, right? So we only have a couple of chemotherapy drugs that are oral. So getting away from IVs is important. Hair loss sometimes is important to people. So those are personal preference absolutely gets to, to uh, uh, play a role. And you can see there's a whole list of different drugs that we can use and we do use. So what about getting back to the BRCA loss or dysfunction? Because that's the biggest story that's closest to translation into the clinical realm. So remember, the rationale for targeting BRCA loss is that we can actually target it. We can target DNA damage response, right? It's a new class of drugs that goes after this as its target. You can use double-strand uh, break-inducing agents. Platinum does that to, to part. Uh, PARP inhibitors goes after DNA to re repair directly. HDAC, so there are different ways that, ca that cancers can lose their uh, function. Some of it is genetic. Some of it is what's called epigenetic, which means that the genes get turned off by other mechanisms. And there are drugs that actually can try turning things back on. Um, the, the, the key of it is trying to get to tumor hypersensitivity and exploiting aberrancies in these pathways for treatment. So PARP inhibition, I described it a little bit before. Here's a little more of a detailed thing. Here's a normal cell where you've got everything is working, and you've got a couple of different ways. Here's the toolbox, right? So you have one tool for repairing DNA with, that's BRCA dependent. It's called homologous recombination. 
There's another mechanism that's PARP dependent, that's called base excision repair. Um, if you don't have BRCA, you know, the cell's going to use the PARP dependent one to fix things that, 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 you know, fix mistakes. Here's a break right there, for example, okay? If you then knock it out with PARP inhibition, you've lost these two are our key ones, and so, sometimes that means the cell just doesn't get to number three or number four. It dies before that happens. I'm calling it an Achilles heel. So what was the first evidence that this is a useful strategy in BRCA-associated tumors? So this is in BRCA-associated breast cancer pretreated. So these patients have had chemotherapy. And you can see olaparib, which is an, uh, a, a PARP inhibitor. A pretty nice response rate, 41%. It's a pill. It's pretty easy to take. It doesn't have a lot. It does have some side effects, but not a ton of side effects. 41% response rate in a pretreated setting using a pill that's not chemotherapy is a pretty nice thing. Small study, as you can see, it's only 27 patients in that arm. 50% um, of them were triple negative. There was some toxicity, but not a lot. It was mostly mild. What about triple negative, not BRCA associated? So we're getting a little bit of a mixed message from different tumor types. So in the ovarian cancer world, if you look up here, so these are called waterfall plots. For those of you who haven't seen these before, this means that while, while the patient was being treated, nothing happened. If the bar goes up, the tumor grew. This is basically the percent growth. If the bar goes down, the tumor shrank with therapy, okay? So ovarian that has, in patients who have BRCA in their germline, they have inherited ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer that's not BRCA, okay? It's what we call sporadic. You can see pretty, you know, decent response rate, and it doesn't seem to matter very much whether it's an inherited ovarian cancer or a non-inherited ovarian cancer. It seems that there's something about ovarian cancer that's sensitive to PARP inhibition. That's that bracca thing that the scientists talk about. However, in breast cancer, this is the same study, they looked also, and again, these are small studies. This is a story that's still being told, but in small studies, there's a little less convincing. So here's breast inherited, breast triple negative, not inherited. And you can see that the tumors that shrank are exclusively those that are inherited, which you know, is similar to what we saw in that first elaprib study, because all of those had inherited breast cancer. But it doesn't give us as much, you know, it looks like you can't just say triple negative and assume that that whole PARP inhibition, BRCA dysfunction story is going to play out. So how do you identify that? I think there's most people think that there are subsets that are not inherited, but in whom BRCA isn't working right. And so we got to be a little smarter than just saying triple negative, you know. Um, so, and, and in fact, if you look at, who here has heard of the Cancer Genome Atlas? Couple people, good, good. Well, for those of you who don't know, the Cancer Genome Atlas is more or less what it sounds like. It was a whole bunch of scientists from all over the country and they all did different, they grabbed a whole bunch of tumors of different subsets and they looked at genes, proteins, RNA, everything in concert. It was scientists working together instead of in silos and trying to create the most comprehensive portrait of breast cancer that's possible. In fact, we did the genetic analyses were done here at UNC. And what you can say is that about 20% of triple negatives have something abnormal in their BRCA. Some of it is from having been inherited. Some of it is acquired over the course of becoming a cancer. Now we've got to figure out how, how to get at those 20%. Um, so remember that it causes homologous recombination problems. And so there are people working on what are called functional assays. A functional assay is, is what that means is that the assay doesn't test the BRCA, for example. It tests what it's supposed to do. So for example, there are certain characteristics in the chromosomes of patients where BRCA is not working. So instead of looking at BRCA and saying, well, what are the eight ways that BRCA can go wrong and having an assay that identifies all those, let's just look at the cells and see if we see evidence that BRCA isn't working right. Okay, And so that's what a lot of these HRD score, and this is something called an NTAI assay. That's what people are trying to do. So, so keep your eyes out for those. All right, so back to, to sort of the summary. 
Uh, you should take triple negative into account even with the first chemotherapy for metastatic disease. Yes or no? Oh, you guys weren't listening. <laughs> Um, uh, triple negative is particularly sensitive. Triple negative. I didn't say. I didn't say BRCA associated. Triple negative is particularly sensitive to platinum drugs. Do we know that? Well, might be. Some might be. And there are genetic tests that help us that we can use in the clinic now to help us identify which chemo to use. No. no. Maybe. No. 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 Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. So the reason I said you should take tri shouldn't take triple negative into account even with the first chemotherapy is what I showed you, like the dogma. Triple negative is not sensitive to taxol. Well, actually, it was. If you actually look in people, what happens in the lab laboratory and in cell lines is not the same as what happens in people. Um, and and I think triple negative is less important than toxicity and preference and all those other important things. Particularly sensitive, plant, maybe, maybe that's where we're going, um, but not all of them. And genetic tests, not yet. OK, so what about targeting? So we talked about chemo. What about getting to, to, to non-chemo? And again, this is a story that's being written. It's not, a, it's, not, it's not here yet. So remember, we talked about all these subsets within triple negative. I'm just going to highlight one thing. And this is, a, this is a challenge for us, right? Remember, these guys we actually have targetable drugs for. We have targetable drugs for luminal breast cancers. It's anti-estrogens. We have drugs for HER2-enriched breast cancers. It's anti-HER2 drugs. But we don't know that a luminal breast cancer that doesn't have estrogen or progesterone receptors in it, the clinical assays, well, we don't know if those drugs would work. That's actually a question that will be answered as people start using some of these molecular subtyping assays in some of these historical um, studies. right? But you may remember the HER2 studies. One of the stories that came out in the big Herceptin adjuvant trials, when they went back and they're like, you know, Herceptin seems to be working in HER2 negative breast cancer. How is that? That's why there's that big NSABP study that's testing Herceptin in HER2 negative breast cancer. Well, part of it may be something like this, right? It may be HER2 negative, but it might be one of the HER2 driven breast cancers. Our clinical assays aren't picking it up. I don't know that, but that's one possible answer for why the NSABP, when they looked back, started saying, hmm. How come Perceptin seems to be working in these guys? It's not supposed to. OK, so there are groups that are doing subsets within triple negative looking specifically for things you can target. So there are some of these different subgroups. These are the little color coding means if you do a particular kind of genomic assay, the cancers tend to segregate themselves, right? They, it's like. It's like you guys at dinner last night where everybody was sitting with their support group, right? So these guys are in their own little support groups. So biologically, they are more similar to each other than they are to the other kinds. Again, these are all triple negative breast cancers. And you, know, and you can see them. Some of them also could be segregated if you just do more traditional uh, um, uh, microarrays. And some of these subtypes are very influenced by, by immune, by what's called the microenvironment. So in truth, those might be really influenced by immune mechanisms. That might be targetable. Some of these other ones actually have a whole bunch of other, you know, we've got DNA damage response genes, as we talked about, maybe that 20%, also growth factor pathways. Some of them seem to be more immune. Now, remember, we have immune targeting drugs that are getting approved now, not in breast cancer, but in other tumor types. Studying them in breast cancer is coming. And then we have. Yeah, the other growth factor pathways, and the androgen receptor, which is a hormone receptor, but it's one traditionally associated with prostate cancer, not breast cancer. Now, there was a study that looked at, OK, if androgen receptor signaling is present in some triple negative breast cancers, what if we gave a prostate cancer drug to women who have androgen receptor positive triple negative breast cancer? It's a great question. So here's. 12% of triple negative breast cancers are androgen receptor positive. And in those, if you just give bicalutamide, which is a pretty easy, you know, straightforward prostate cancer drug, about one in five, the cancer stopped growing for six months. Now, two things. Bicalutamide is not that great a drug. I mean, in targeting the androgen receptor, we have better drugs than that that are coming out. But it's, it's, it's a tolerable drug, and it's a well-used drug. But there might be ways of getting that to be more powerful. Number two, 
controlling the disease for six months isn't the same as a strong response, right? It, this is a modest effect. This is not a home run. It's a, it's a hint that this may be worthwhile. And the last thing is it took 450 patients to get 26. So this is going to be a niche. It might be a valuable niche, but it's a niche. Now, we may end up with a whole bunch of niches in triple negative breast cancer. That's OK. But then you're going to need 12 niche drugs, not one, right? Because this is only going to benefit a few people, even if we can tweak it to make it better. So that's actually the purpose of some of these trials. And you're going to see these, you know, where you start with some sort of assay on the tumor. You find, hopefully, something that you can target. And then the patient goes into a trial that's, you know, you're kind of taking the whole realm of, you know, a few hundred women, and they're all going into different baskets to test rational approaches. Now, the last, and then I'll take questions. The last thing I want to talk about is inflammatory breast cancer. Again, it's a really a pivot, because again, there, you know, inflammatory breast cancer can be any subtype. But there's a few characteristic uh, elements about inflammatory breast cancer that are worth commenting on. So first, it's rare, right? It's in most countries. There are a few countries, like Pakistan inexplicably seems to have a lot of inflammatory breast cancer. But most countries, it makes up less than 5% of the breast cancers that are diagnosed. It's characterized, like I said, by redness, swelling, tenderness, and warmth in the breast. It is, the one overlap with, with triple negative is, is more likely to be found in younger women, African American women, and obese women. It's usually, you know, well, it's not usually, but it's more often hormone receptor negative, and there's, more, there's a higher proportion that are HER2 positive than the average non-inflammatory breast cancer. And it is a poor prognosis subtype. A third of them have presenting stage 4 de novo metastatic disease. From the moment they're diagnosed, they already have stage 4 disease, which, as you know, in non-inflammatory breast cancer, that number is more like 5 to 10 percent. So why is it red and all that stuff? So the reason, the underlying reason, is there's something about the cancers that, that cause them to have a propensity to leave the, the breast parenchyma that they started from, and they get into the lymphatic vessels that are in the skin. They get into the lymphatic vessels below there, but that skin part, it, pl it plugs it up. So they get into those lymphatic vessels. Remember, your lymph system is designed to drain fluid out of tissues. That's why people who have axillary dissection sometimes get lymphedema, right? Because they've lost all the lymphatic tissue that's in their armpit. You still drain the fluid out of your arm, but it's just a little more challenging. This is the same process, but in the breast. So now you've clogged up the lymphatic vessels in the skin. The skin gets backed up, right? It's pressure. It, what happens when you get backed up? It gets swollen. It gets red, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we don't really know why this happens. Like, what is it on a molecular basis? We know that they're one of the key things that's wrong with inflammatory breast cancer is the, the proteins that help cells talk to each other are not normal which is probably why they are less stuck to each other and they are more prone to going into places they do not belong. For example, those lymph, skin lymph vessels is not where breast cells belong. What about treatment? So the first is you start with medical therapy. So as many of you know, for non-inflammatory breast cancer, we sometimes the cancer extent is so large that you really can't, the tumor is inoperable when it's diagnosed, that's uncommon. Most of the time, we have choices. And we can either give medical therapy first, usually chemotherapy, but more and more nowadays with uh, postmenopausal women, we're doing endocrine therapy first. It actually works pretty well. Um, but, but you have a choice, because most women's cancers are not inoperable. If you give the medical therapy first or last, it doesn't matter. Five years later, 10 years later, survival is the same. It's sometimes practical choices let us decide which whether the surgeon goes first or the medical oncologist goes first. Not so with inflammatory breast cancer. Inflammatory breast cancer is inoperable, right? It is an inoperable tumor. So you got to give your chemotherapy first. We add trastuzumab or Herceptin if it's HER2 positive, but you lead with medical therapy always in inflammatory breast cancer. Number two, lumpectomy is not an option. Okay, you cannot do a lumpectomy. It is far too extensive a disease. You can't clear the breast, and there's a big problem with local recurrence, which, as you know, with non-inflammatory breast cancer, 
recurrence may be a problem. And it can be on the chest wall or in the breast, but that's not the co most common place. In inflammatory, that is actually one of the biggest risks of inflammatory is a local recurrence. So you have to be locally more aggressive than you would be with another uh, breast cancer. So mastectomy, always. Radiation, again, radiation is key because this is a locally aggressive cancer. So you got to throw what you have. What tools are in the toolbox for local control? Well, the tools in the toolbox are medical therapy, surgery, radiation. Now, this approach, which is a true multidisciplinary approach, if you think about it, this is you know, kind of the, the you know, first version of this. This approach, when it's done well, has improved local control rates from historically people had chest wall disease. More than half of them developed recurrent chest wall disease. Now, it's only you know, 20, 30%. It might even be better now. These are slightly old numbers. Now, if it recurs, so then, of course, after your radiation local therapy, you know, it's treated the same as every other non-inflammatory breast cancer in terms of medical therapy if it's HER2 positive or hormone receptor positive. If it recurs, it's also treated the same as non-inflammatory breast cancer in terms of medical management. <laughs> So to summarize, triple negative breast cancer is a heterogeneous disease. Chemotherapy is our mainstay. And at the moment, we make more or less the same choices as other subtypes. Platinum drugs are often given. Whether we should be strategizing differently about the platinum drugs, for example, using them first, is something that we don't have data yet. But in three months, we'll, know, we'll actually have the answer to that question in three months. Um, inherited breast cancer, you know, e the clinical information seems to be dovetailing with the laboratory information that it does seem to be more sensitive to DNA damaging drugs. Exactly how to exploit that the best is something that's being worked on, but, but I think that's a, that, you know, we're, 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 it's been a consistent finding. Less so for triple negative non-inherited. And inflammatory breast cancer, just remember, it can be any subtype. The main approach that's different is you're always going to use chemotherapy first. You're never going to do a lumpectomy, and you're going to use radiation. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you. But I'm happy to answer questions if anybody has them. Yeah. So what are your thoughts then? What are your thoughts on the gen I, I wrote it as genomic or foundational mm -hmm. on testing and using those drugs for triple negative based on those results? I give an example of Zalcori. Of, of sorry? Zalcori. Zalcori. What's the real name of that? Uh, it starts with a C. Okay, uh, that's all right. It's all right. It's but you're saying it's using. Cancer, using, yeah, yeah, using. So. Um, you know, I think that's a genome forward, you know, that, that trial design that I talked about. That is a genome forward approach. Um, I think it is absolutely the, the, the right way to handle on trials. The problem we have is that drugs that are, you know, a breast cancer that has a certain molecular abnormality may not act the same as a lung cancer that has that molecular abnormality. We already know, for example, that BRAF inhibitors, which are you know, great drugs for melanoma, the same aberration found in a colon cancer, they don't work. So I think it's terrific. And I think many of the companies are collecting information if they're allowed. I mean, it's hard to get drugs that are off-label like that. But if, but if they do get given, some of, the, some of the companies are themselves putting out drugs, targeted drugs, when they are indicated by Foundation One or other of those sorts of what are called sequencing assays, and then collecting information about what happens. I think it's a bad idea to use a drug that in a way that it's not conventionally used because of an assay that hasn't been validated for that purpose, and at least not collect information about whether it worked or not, right? I mean, we did this with, with uh, bone marrow transplantation for years before we figured out that they didn't work. Right? It sounded like a good idea, so everybody did it. Um, so, I, so I'm very cautious about that. I do think doing it in a setting where you're collecting information and you're actually you know, doing research on the idea is it's exactly the way we're going. And, and I'm very supportive of that. Yeah, how about in the back? You? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. 
So people typically stay on chemotherapy if they have metastatic disease for as long as it's working and not making them sick. And that, that is the case, and I'm going to say another thing. So working, the definition of working, if you have symptomatic cancer, is you have to kind of you have to shrink it, right? Because you want to improve the symptoms. So that's the definition of working. For a person who's feeling well, where the scan shows that their cancer is metastasized, but they're feeling fine, working means the cancer stopped growing, not that it shrank. I don't care if it shrank or not, as long as it's not growing and it's not bothering you. So. Because that's the term I thought that we used to say, stable. Stable is exactly which is right. Wonderful. Yeah, which is it's exactly which right. Is wonderful. So being that man is stable and everything is working good, I know I have a couple of other friends, my best friend, she's, you know, I have a couple of them doing bird, she's not doing good. She's been doing a lot of trials. Mm -hmm. And now, do you recommend or suggest trials for all or the majority of um, metastasized patients mm -hmm. or? Yep. We consider trials in every patient at every decision point. You know, if they're coming off of it, if they've just been diagnosed, then we look at trial options, we look at non-trial options, and we make a decision. It, it, when, if they get toxicity and they have to come off of a drug and you have to go to a new drug, trial options not every time. And, and it, it's, it's obviously practical for us on the provider side because we need to know the answer to her question, like should we use an ALK1 inhibitor, which is a lung cancer drug, if we happen to find an ALK1 fusion, which hardly ever happens in breast cancer, but say we find it, should we use a lung cancer drug? I mean, I don't know the answer to that question. Unless we do research in it, we're never going to know the answer to that question. So you know, for our future patients, we want to collect as much information as we can. From the patient's standpoint, there's also a motivation here in that you know, the standard drugs don't go away, right? If you go on a trial and you try something investigational or novel, you know, it's not that the halibut that you would have gotten next is not going to be there. It's always going to be there. That particular trial may not be there six months from now, but the, but the drugs that are approved are not going anywhere. So you can put those in your back pocket while you're considering a, a newer approach. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have IBC, chemotherapy, and BRCA1. Mm -hmm. um, I had a recurrence, a second occurrence, on the other side. How often are patients told when they have BRCA and chemotherapy that there is that recurrent issue that could come up? Maybe not for mastectomy. I, I had a prophylactic mastectomy and it still came mm -hmm. back. Not came back, but had a second occurrence. I'm sorry, you're talking about a second breast cancer? Yes, yeah, second breast cancer. Yeah. You know, I don't, I mean, you're asking me how often do doctors tell no, patients about I, 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 I don't know. Do patients, should patients know that? Should patients have a choice? Mm -hmm. should, know, should know about that and have a choice to have a complete mastectomy, prophylactic mastectomy instead of just a Oh, a I see what you're asking. The, well, so lumpectomy, I mean, the main decision point for a BRCA carrier is, you know, What's the risk of, of getting a second primary in the same breast or on the other side if you have an inherited propensity? And that conversation should take place with every patient that has BRCA testing that's positive. That needs to be part of this surgical decision making. And I think for the most part, I mean, certainly the surgeons that I interact with, it is routinely part of that conversation. In fact, one of our indications for using neoadjuvant chemotherapy is because the BRCA testing's not back yet, and we want to get the medical, the medical therapy is not affected by the results of the bracket test. We use the same chemotherapy as we just went over. But the surgeon wants to know because they're going to guide and have a different conversation with the patient about 
whether they're, you know, some patients are totally committed to having breast conservation no matter what. I have a patient who had a lumpectomy and declined radiation and has a BRCA mutation and got a second cancer, right? I, mean, I said, okay, we know how this is going to end. But, um, and she just said, okay, and if that happens, I'll deal with it then. That's a personal choice. But it is a different conversation with a BRCA carrier at the time of surgical decision making and absolutely has to be part of the conversation. It doesn't mean the patient has to do one thing or another. It just means they have to have the information. It wasn't very, very much. It, it's not even one conversation. Yeah, well, and I think that's unusual, thankfully. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for being so thorough. My head is sort of swimming. <laughs> 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 Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, three times passing. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And so they said my tumor, part of my tumor went to LA to check this. Will they be doing that more routinely? I mean, I don't think I'm on the, the, the medicine because I'm not having the side effects. Um, but I mean, I would like to get on it to try it. If this, what I'm taking isn't working because I'm ERP positive, it's working mm -hmm. right now. So she said, just Good. let's go with it. And, but I'm just wondering, you know, wow, if I knew that right away, would that have been a first choice? Of, Will they be doing, is it what you're talking to her they, about, what genetically, is, is that a genetic thing or a chemical assay? Well, so, so uh, you're hitting exactly the problem, which is PI3 kinase, for example. So for those of you who don't know, PI3 kinase is a pathway, like estrogen receptor signaling. It's a signaling pathway. It's one of the ways in which cells grow. It's a normal signaling pathway in the cell. Um, uh, there are drugs that are being developed that target that pathway. And many people think, you know, in, in a sense, Everolimus or Affinitor sort of targets that pathway, which is an already approved drug in breast cancer um, for ER positive disease. Um, the however is, so you can, you can have abnormal PI3 kinase signaling through a mutation in PI3 kinase, through a mutation in a different related protein that affects PI3 kinase or in a whole host of things below that. And in TCGA, you know, one of the eye-opening things in TCGA was PI3 kinase mutations, sort of yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Then they also looked at a signature, right? So where you're looking at the gene's expression. When they looked four different ways, four different ways, not just one way, but four different ways of measuring the activity in the pathway did not correlate at all with the presence or absence of the mutation. So the problem is there are too many other ways to mess up how the pathway is acting that if you just look at this, you know, it could get turned off up here, turned back on down here. Or it could be on here and turned off down here. And until we know the best way to measure it that's actually reliable, how will we know what, who to give the drugs to? So the problem with all of these genomic tests, and they're very exciting. Well, listen, we do them. Everybody, you know, this is the way of the future, is a much more comprehensive portrait of the cancer cell. The however mm. is the devil's in the details here, right? And just because the test sounds good or looks good doesn't mean it actually gives you meaningful information. And there's, a, there's an increasingly often used phrase in, in our world, which is, you know, a bad assay is as dangerous as a bad drug, right? So we have to know, and the FDA actually is getting much more into this because they're realizing that it's like the Wild West out there with these genomic tests, right? Nobody was paying attention to this stuff. And the FDA is becoming much more uh, interested, <laughs> well, suffice it to say, which has its bad points and its good points, in regulating this because they're really concerned about this sort of explosion of tests that, you know, you can get done that may or may not actually measure what you think you're measuring, even if the drug is good. You know, if you give the drug to the wrong patient, then you're not doing them any favors, and you don't give it to the right patient because your assay told you that it wouldn't work and the assay was bad. So. Can you change from an ER negative to a positive? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so when we, if you serially biopsy breast cancer, most of the time it stays the same, what we call phenotype, ERP or HER2. Um, about 15% of the time, over time, one or another of them shifts. Now, what, whether that means something therapeutically is a separate question, right? I don't know if I have an ER positive breast cancer that is ER negative 
five years later when I biopsy, I don't know that there isn't still ER positive or ER driven breast cancer in there. And I would never say don't use anti-estrogen therapy because the last biopsy is the, is the magic one. Um, but it does, that heterogeneity does, we do think about it as we're making decisions and it does happen in a, in a minority of cases. Yeah. Uh, how do you distinguish between primary inflammatory and secondary inflammatory? What do you mean by secondary inflammatory? Well, as I understand it, and I may be wrong, but as I understand it, if you have a breast tumor, sometimes the tumor can produce inflammatory uh, features in the breast, but the cancer itself is considered to be, the, the inflammation is considered to be a secondary feature of the main thing, which is the tumor, as opposed to inflammatory breast cancer, primary inflammatory, which is inflammatory features are the nature of the breast cancer. Oh, yeah. Um, so, the way that's distinguished, so I think what, what you're getting is that sometimes patients will have the clinical appearance of inflammatory breast cancer. The, the breast is red, it's inflamed, it's warm, it's all of that stuff. It gets the orange peel, whatever, you know, all of those check, 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 check. Um, that can be the hallmark of inflammatory breast cancer, which is the tumor cells that have lost the ability to talk to each other correctly and they get into the lymphatics and they clog it up in the breast skin. Sometimes you can get the same clinical appearance by blocking the lymph drainage system in a different part. Like, so say you have a lot of lymph nodes here and they get stuck to each other and they get stuck to the chest wall and they push on the, the, the you know, the lymphatic drainage goes out of the breast up, you know, it, it, it goes through this part of your body. So you can get the same appearance by blocking off the lymphatic drainage up here, which is a mechanical problem. It's not a biological problem. Do you see what I mean? It's, it's still cancer, but it's not inflammatory breast cancer. Yeah, and how do you distinguish between them? Well, you look and see if they've got giant, I mean, typically it's because of giant matted lymph nodes up here. And if you see giant matted lymph nodes up here, then you have to worry that this might be a mechanical problem. Mm -hmm. You also won't see, in the biopsy, you won't see the clogging cells in the skin lymphatic vessels. So you can also figure it out pathologically and then anatomically, essentially. Yeah. Great question. When they get it, when one of them gets FDA approved, there's a couple of them that are on that are moving pretty quickly along in BRCA associated tumors, not just breast cancer. They're coming. They're going to be in our lifetime. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. I think it won't be too long. Another question is: I have uh, inflammatory breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer. And I also have um, ITP, which is, which is, um, um, I don't know, um, Idiopathic thrombocytopenia, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. I have low plates, uh -huh. and I, they run typically around 30 to 40,000. Mm -hmm. And I live with them, I have surgery with them, they work really well, but it disqualifies me for any yeah. clinical trial that I can't get in. Right. Had to get into yours. Sorry. <laughs> so, but it, it has to be other people like me somewhere, you know, yeah. that have this, this IPP thing. Yeah. What do we do for, for patients like that? I mean, well, unfortunately, for investigational approaches, typically people with abnormal kidneys, abnormal liver, abnormal platelets, abnormal hearts, abnormal, you know, underlying all the other organs have to be kind of in, in normal condition. And the reason for that is in the investigational setting, they're asking questions about whether the drug works, but also what side effects it causes. And so they really can't put patients in who have abnormal underlying function, because then they won't be able to tell if the drug makes platelets go down or not. So it's a, it's a real challenge for otherwise healthy patients who want to participate. But I'm afraid, you know, outside of a few, now some trials deliberately target patient populations that have something unusual, right. abnormal heart or whatever. And then, you know, if that trial comes along, then it's a great opportunity. And some trials ha are relatively um, open, you know, to, by their criteria. Some are more restricted than others. Mm -hmm. You know, or you treat the underlying thing, take steroids or something. You know. so, so, yeah. So what's the treatment regimen for this kind of patients? Like, you, you do conventional chemotherapy and then mm -hmm. use patient-increasing uh, drugs? You know, a lot of ITP patients or patients with that, that you know, an analogous, um, uh, you know, 
uh, thrombocytopenia, their platelets, you know, if you, you know, we don't have to use drugs that are that are particularly hard on platelets. Most of the chemotherapy drugs that we use in breast cancer don't affect platelets that much. A few do. Carbo does, gemcitabine does, and you know, you can either dose the drug to, you know, keep an eye on things, or you can choose other drugs that don't really affect platelets. I mean, most of the drugs I like to use don't affect platelets that much, and I just monitor. I mean, I've given I've given chemotherapy to platelet patients with platelet counts of 5, right? No, you do it you know, I mean, that was because, and the reason I did that, well, I, I needed to, the patient needed to have chemo, but the other was that the reason, it was different from you, the reason her platelet count was five was because her bone marrow had been completely replaced with tumor. So I did her, you know, and, and the referring doc did, had no interest in giving her chemotherapy because it was scared to death, not, not surprisingly. Um, but I said, you know, if it works, your platelet count won't be five anymore, it's gonna be 100. So let's give it a shot. And but, but you know, we both had to walk in knowing that, you know, I, I you know I could have killed her. But you know, he needed to have some sort of treatment. I think we have to go because it's 11:09. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Sure.